So you've got your brand new item, you've taken it out of the box, and uh, you are about to use it. Now you'll either do one of two things. You'll either just say, well, we'll just trial and error, we'll just push a few buttons, we'll just turn a few knobs and see how everything works out. Or else you will take the maker's handbook and you will read it from cover to cover. I think the first tends to be maybe the ladies' way of doing things, just push the buttons and hope it works. And men tend to go into all the instructions. Now, I know that's not uh, true right across the board, but uh, different people do different things. But if you read the booklet, you will, uh, first of all, I suppose, be congratulated on the fact that you have chosen this particular item to use and you've made the best choice that you possibly could. It will tell you about all the wonderful things that it can do for you. And then it will warn you about the dangers of this item and the things that you're to avoid and how you can ensure your own safety when you're using it. Now, I think in a sense, Jesus is saying those things to the 72 that he is sending out on this short-term mission before him, and he will follow after them and they are to go and prepare the way, because he's telling them that there's a harvest, and that they are to go into that harvest, and they are to take the good news of the kingdom of God. But he's also warning them about things that they are to expect. So, he's encouraging on the one hand, and flagging up some things that they might be aware of. Now, I want to just say, to remind you, as we said before, that you and I, if we know Jesus Christ, if we belong to Him, then we are the 72. And we are sent not into the towns around us, not to make that physical journey, but to wherever God has placed us, wherever He's put us. And tonight, we're going to be thinking about that. We call it the front line. Wherever God has us in life, God sends each of us who know Him. Jesus said to His disciples, as the Father sent me, so I send you. He said, after His resurrection, go and be my witnesses. And these, these verses talk about that, but they also talk about the people to whom these disciples would go and to whom we go as well. And I want just to suggest that there are in, there's in this passage, first of all, there is two what I simply want to call gospel warnings. Now, uh, he, he's talking about the towns that are nearby, so we can assume that in the crowd that is listening to him as he commissions these 72, there are people from those towns, and he's saying to them, woe to you, or great sorrow awaits you, and the inhabitants of those towns. And I want to just say that Jesus in these verses seems to be giving gospel warnings, first of all, about privilege, about privilege. He says, woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida. Now, we don't know much about Chorazin, but we do know that Bethsaida was the home of Peter and Andrew. It was there, recorded in Mark 8, that Jesus healed a man who was blind, and it sounds from this that He did lots of other miracles in Bethsaida as well. We know a lot about Capernaum. That was the home of Matthew. It was there that Jesus called Peter and Matthew and James and John. In Matthew 4, it tells us that Jesus lived in Capernaum. Matthew 9 calls Capernaum his town. We know He went to the synagogue there. He preached there. It was in Capernaum that He called Himself the bread of life and did many miracles. And Jesus is saying to these people that if the miracles that were done in Chorazin and Bethsaida, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, the people in those towns would have repented, they would have done so deeply, but the people in Chorazin and Bethsaida did not repent. They did not turn from their sin to Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them, look in verse 14, it will be more bearable in the judgment or better in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon because they didn't have the miracles done in them that you had done in you. And then he turns and talks about Capernaum. 
And he says, on you, verse 15, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? That's obviously what they thought would happen. He says, no, you will go down to the depths or to Hades. And you see, Jesus is talking about privilege. He's saying to these people that they had great privilege when He ministered. They were able to see the Son of God in the flesh. They experienced His presence. They heard His preaching. They observed His power, and they made no response. Capernaum assumed that they would be lifted up because of all the things that Jesus did in their town. They presumed that everything was well, and Jesus says, you are in for a terrible shock because you did not respond. In Matthew 11, it says that Jesus denounced the towns in which most of His miracles were performed because they did not repent. Now, we can apply that to today, can't we? And to this society and to this congregation. Because it's possible, you see, to assume that because we live in a day when we know all about Christian things, we believe in God, we have the Bible, we maybe have many copies in our home, we possibly go to church on a regular basis, we understand the gospel, we have all the evangelical privileges, we have grown up with them, and therefore, because we know about these things and because we've experienced them, all will be okay. And Jesus is saying, no, it won't. There's a great danger that we can have all of these privileges and still be cast out. What an awful thought. What is it that really matters? Well, Jesus tells us. Look at verse 20. He says, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's what really mattered, you see, as far as Jesus Christ was concerned. That was what was important, that they would have saving faith, that they would enter the kingdom, that they would belong to the King and become His children. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says right at the end of it, about those people who were involved in spiritual and supernatural things, he said, depart from me, for I never knew you. You see, it's not the things that we're familiar with that matter. It's how we respond to them. And we can be lost forever. We can go to that place that the Bible calls hell, knowing the gospel in all of its details and having listened to it Sunday after Sunday. Sometimes people say to me, well, you know, I would believe, I would respond if I could see a miracle of some kind. If God would do something supernatural and dramatic, I would really believe. Well, let's remember, these places had many miracles, and few of the people in those places believed in Jesus Christ. I have a friend who has worked for many years in the south of Ireland, and he's told me about on a number of occasions he met people who had never heard the gospel before, and the first time they heard the message, they responded to that gospel and entered into the kingdom of God, and their names were written in heaven. Some of them had been far away from God in immorality. Some of them had been steeped in religion, but never understood some of them, when they heard for the first time, they immediately came to faith in Jesus Christ. What a delight for Him. But it's possible, you know, for some of you gathered here to have opportunities and privileges all your life and still be lost forever. It's not the privilege that we have, but how we respond to the grace of God. So, privilege is one warning, and the second warning that Jesus gives, I think, is about, it's about pride, because 
when they come back, when these 72 come back and they're full of joy, Jesus says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. So, there are two groups of people that Jesus is talking about. One of them the gospel is hidden to. They don't see it. They don't respond. And the other understands. It makes sense. They grasp it, and they believe, and their names are written in heaven. Now, I don't think this is talking about literal, wise, and learned, or literal children, because that would mean if someone was clever and educated, they were well-read, that these things would be hidden from them. And of course, that's not true. We know some people who are very clever and very intelligent, and they're Christian people. It would also mean, on the other hand, that if you're under five, if you were a small child, then you would get it. But these are two pictures of the heart, you see, the attitude that we have within us. And the first group, those who Jesus says are wise and learned, are those who don't have to be told. They can work it out for themselves. They've got their own thoughts and their own ideas. They've learned a lot throughout their years, and they don't need somebody to come and tell them anything about God or about how they can be right with God. They're proud. They've studied, and they've got their own way, and they don't need the gospel. And then the other group, the little children, they don't have any pride. They're lowly in heart. They know that they have nothing to offer God. They're not important. They're willing to be told. They have humility and innocence. They accept the things that they hear. If we're in the first group, if we are wise and learned in our own eyes, we will not grasp the gospel because it will not appeal to our logic it will offend our pride because it tells us to bow before God with open hands and receive something that we cannot provide for ourselves. And if we are wise and learned and proud in our own eyes and in our hearts, we will simply not accept this. But the second group, if we're like the little children, there's hope because if we're humble in heart, then we recognize that we don't have the answers, and we'll listen to God, we'll believe what He tells us, and then it's possible for us to respond to God's invitation and His grace. There's a little verse in Isaiah 57, and verse 15, it says this, this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but, listen to this, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. And that describes those people who realize that all they can do is cast themselves on the mercy and the grace and the love of God in Jesus Christ and receive what they can never achieve in any other way. So, let me ask you this morning, which group are you in? Would you say to me this morning, oh, I've got my own ideas. I know I've listened to all this stuff, and I know all about the gospel, and uh, I, I'm familiar with all those things, but I've got my own ideas, and I don't need anybody to tell me. Could it be that the gospel is hidden from you? You've never understood it. You're a decent person, maybe a church-going person regularly, but you've never grasped the need for salvation? Or are you like the little child? In your heart, have you said, yes, I understand. I know something about who God is and what I am, and I know that all I can do is ask Him in His mercy to forgive me and to save me and to keep me. Well, it's to that group that the eyes can be open, and you can have your name written in heaven. So, there's two gospel warnings, but there's also two what I simple, simply want to call gospel encouragements, because as Mark referred to earlier, Jesus tells these people they're going out, there'll be opposition, they're going like lambs among wolves. There are places where they will not be welcomed, 
And isn't that true in our 21st century? There is an ever-expanding group to whom Christians are unwelcome. They don't want to hear, not interested, happy just to put you down, to stand against you, to ridicule. But there's two great encouragements as we go out to wherever God has placed us. And the first one is this. I simply want to say that we have the encouragement of the person of Christ. Look at verse 22. All things have been committed to me, Jesus says, by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. If people want to know God, the way to know Him is Jesus Christ. That's what He is saying here. He is God's plan, the purpose of God from the beginning, and which moved through the centuries is Jesus Christ. In Him we have the full and complete and final revelation of our Creator. Christ is the center of all that God intends to do. As the planets in our solar system revolve around the sun, so the kingdom of God revolves around the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He says, all things have been given to me. Hebrews tells us that He is the heir of all things. He is the author of the universe, the radiance of God. He sustains all things. And that's why, you see, in the ministry of Jesus that He continually pointed to Himself, whereas other teachers and wise people and leaders pointed to the path. Here's the path. Here are the rules. Here are the regulations. Go on this path. Follow those regulations. Jesus always said, come to Me. He said, I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the life. I am the way. I am the bread. I am the truth. I am the water, the light, the resurrection. And in Jesus Christ, we can have all that we need. If we know Him, you see, we have a great privilege, a great privilege. Look at verse 23. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. They are the most blessed generation in the history of our world. And you and I, in a sense, are in a similar category because we live after the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We have the Bible completed. We have God's revelation in all its fullness. And we are greatly blessed. God has said everything to us. He doesn't have to add. Although we haven't seen Christ with our physical eyes or touched Him with our hands, we hear with the heart and we see with the soul. Peter said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And let's remember, as we go out wherever God has placed us, we go in the name of this one. We are His ambassadors, and we represent Him. He lives within us. We show Him to the world, and God has entrusted the gospel to us, and we are channels of that message. And look what he says in verse 16, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me, but he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The people that we have contact with will not see Jesus Christ with their human eyes or hear His voice audibly, most of them, but they see us, and they listen to our words, and we present Christ to them. And their reaction to us, Jesus is saying, is a reflection of how they view Jesus Christ. Now, we need to add a word of caution, don't we? Because sometimes we can give offense. We need to make sure that we're not, that we're not hypocritical in the way that we live so that people simply dismiss what we are and what we believe. But if we're genuine and if they do not respond and do not welcome and reject 
what we say they are spurning the gospel. It's a comfort to us, isn't it, as we live out our lives wherever God has put us. It's not our message. It's a heavenly message. We're simply the messengers. And the church is not our club. It's God's living body. And we want to share what God has given to us and leave the rest to Him. So the person of Christ, who was the center of all of God's purposes. And the second word of encouragement is the power of Christ. As we live for Christ and present Him to a lost world, let's remember that we are confronting Satan. We're engaged in a spiritual warfare. That's what was going on here. And Christ is able to give us the victory. Notice what He says in verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now, he may be talking about Christ falling like lightning when He fell from heaven because the Bible teaches us that. He was cast out of heaven when He rebelled. But I think this is also a reference to what is going on in the ministry of the 72. He is giving them authority. Now, I don't necessarily think it's uh, literally to trample on snakes. We know that Satan is called that great snake or serpent. I think it means that the 72 and us also, we have the power of God to enable us to overcome the enemy. And let's remember that Christ dealt the final blow to Satan's kingdom on the cross when He removed the sting of death, which is sin. And through His blood, He made it possible for us to be forgiven. And He provided salvation and the gift of eternal life. And as we live out and share the gospel, let's remember, it is the power of God today in the same way as it was then. And God, through the gospel, is able to change lives. And if there are people out there who are hungry and thirsty and want to know why they're here and what life is all about and what lies beyond the grave, we can tell them. And if by the grace of God they respond, then what a joy that will be. And the power of Christ can be at work in their lives and in their hearts. They can come from darkness to light and from death to life. They can be lifted out of the pit and put on a rock and have a song in their mouths and their hearts. They can be lost and be found. They can be in despair and have hope. They can be brought into the kingdom of God and into His family, and God can become their father. It is still possible, praise God. Even in our 21st century, high-tech, sophisticated, secular world, the gospel is still the power of God to salvation. And let's hold on to that. It doesn't depend on our eloquence or our powers of persuasion. It depends on God's grace and power in the good news of the gospel. Let's go for Him wherever He has put us. And remember, as the Scripture tells us, greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. And pray that God will use our weak efforts and save some, and what joy we will have in that. What we sang earlier on can happen to people that we know in our families, in our place of work, in our street, and in the club that we relax in. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joys. Then your Spirit gave me life, opened up your Word to me through the gospel of your Son. Give me endless hope and peace. Oh, that God would do that again in the lives of those who we love and know and care for.
and that He would use us, frail, weak human vessels, to be the channels of grace that might bring life to those around us. May it be so. Let's pray together.